Hello and welcome everyone in another episode of Researcher Celebrity powered by Empowering Science Foundation. Today, we have Sydney Velasquez with us and Sydney has done her bachelor's in molecular and cell biology from Texas A&M. She is going to start PhD school at University of Florida Gainesville in Florida. And with this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Sydney at the platform. Sydney, welcome. Hello, thank you. So Sid, how, how, we always start our conversation that how and when you decided that you want to be a researcher. Yeah, so when I went to Texas A&M, I had the idea of going to vet school, which sounds like a lot of people that I work with had the same idea. Um, but I think my freshman year, I really quickly realized that I was more interested in uh, basic research and understanding why we applied certain techniques in the vet field, uh, more so than I was interested in um, applying it in a clinical practice. And so I started looking more towards research. Um, and that's how I ended up here was my love for science was always there, but it shifted from vet med to um, right now, I'm more interested in molecular biology research. So PhD. Why? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I was, when I decided I didn't want to do vet school anymore, I was trying to think about how I can continue within the field of science. And I, I've always wanted to continue learning. I never liked the idea of leaving college and then stopping learning. And so I came across um, the idea of working in research. And, you know, with research, you're always learning something new, always reading papers. Um, and even when you're not, you're learning and discovering things that people haven't discovered yet. So I thought a PhD would help me get into research so that I can continue to learn and I would never have to stop. As well as I'm, I really like solving puzzles. puzzles. And from working in Dr. Edelman's lab, I got hands-on experience and I realized it's a lot of puzzle solving and I enjoy doing that. So I think a PhD will help me get there. So do you have a roadmap ahead of you that what you want to do in your PhD? Uh, so I haven't even started the program yet. So I've got a bunch of like vague ideas of how it's going to work. I'm still thinking it through. Um, but I, I really want to study epigenetic regulation in viruses. And actually in Florida, there's quite a handful of labs, quite a few labs that do that. So I'm hoping to rotate through those labs, get a feel of which one I like. And then hopefully I'll pick one that I like and I'll get my PhD from that lab. And then after PhD... I'm not super sure yet what I want to do. I still have a lot of, um, I guess, roadblocks to encounter before I figure it out. But I'm thinking it'll probably be either industry or academia, like a lot of people. No, absolutely. I think just making up mind for PhD is the first road uh, block. How we see that most of the people gave up gave up on research before PhD. Some do it after later. But what one thing which is most important that when you took your time before enrolling into a PhD program. You did a two year or plus research at Texas A&M where you have, so if you can share that journey that what was the major challenges of a researcher you faced in there and what were the reasons where you were not stoppable by those roadblocks and you chose that, okay, you wanted to be a PhD. Yeah, so it's um, working in research is always challenging. There's ups and downs to it. I think some of the roadblocks I had was you have to troubleshoot. A lot of times you'll do something over and over, modify it, do it again, repeat it, and it just doesn't work. So you have to get through, I guess, the mental block of wanting to quit. You have to keep finding a way to make it work or a way around it. Um, and that's part of the puzzle solving thing that I like, but it could also be um, very stressful or can kind of beat you down. Um, a lot of times I feel like people connect, like who you are, like as a researcher is a big part of you. And so it can kind of beat up your mental health when you're struggling in the lab or things aren't going right, or you think, you know, you're having imposter syndrome and you think you don't know enough to be there. That can be difficult. Um, but it's very rewarding once you get past those roadblocks, you figure it out, you're very like proud of yourself and you did it. You finally realize you know enough to get where you need to go. Um, so I think that is what sort of helped me stay with research. It didn't really scare me away because I realized that with enough hard work that I could do it. It was something that I enjoyed doing. 
even when you know times were hard in the lab it it gets better and i enjoyed it i think this is something which we always try to convey through this uh, channel where we talk about how researchers should be celebrities because everyone no, researchers are just like human beings like everyone else they have their own issues with the their job their work sometimes the experiments go exactly the way they want but it is really sometimes most of the time it just goes all over the place but not the way you want and yeah. I already mentioned so here all the audience and viewers i'm sure by now you have seen the experiences from different groups early career researchers emeritus researcher the way they look at research is always common and that is that they never give up they always say that there are so many roadblocks people say roller coaster ride everything but the only one thing which they stick on that they never give up on research that's what make them researcher we're stubborn people <laughs> absolutely so said when you say that you wanted to do a phd you wanted to do a research people have do like as you already have done research for 2 years without uh, you know thinking of enrolling into a phd and then while you were applying for the different universities for this admission if you can share that thoughts because most of our researchers the followers also they want to apply to phd schools what are the things they should consider the most yeah so um one of the big things i considered when i was looking at programs was um the labs what type of research they were doing within these programs um I was given a lot of advice that you need to be studying something that you enjoy because if you don't enjoy it you're 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 going to struggle with it and you're going to be um, not seeing the point of doing it and so you know a PhD is a really difficult thing to get through. And so I was looking for labs that had they were studying what I wanted to study, something that I felt passionate about. I didn't want to just choose a lab um just to choose something and just to get through my PhD. I want to enjoy it and make sure that I was enjoying it so that I could get through it. And there was a less chance that I wouldn't be able to complete the program. So the biggest thing that I um, would recommend would be looking at the labs they have, make sure they have something that you could see yourself enjoying. The other thing that I was looking at was um, their bioinformatics programs was something I was really interested in. And so I was trying to pick the best programs also based on how much they focused on bioinformatics and what courses they had available to me. Um, those were the, like the two main things that I was looking at. I also, whenever I was doing interviews, I was also asking people a lot of questions, getting to know people. I was really looking at how friendly people were, how open they were to talking with me about their experiences um, working in that program. And I was also asking questions about uh, PIs and the postdocs they worked with. I, I'm really looking for an environment that's going like, to nurture learning and not set me back. And so I think the type of people you work with is also really important once you get to, I guess, the interview stage of choosing a PhD program. Absolutely. I think we always come back to the points like talking to PI is one thing, but having all over purview of the lab that at different stages so if a technician what they has to say about the lab environment a phd student graduate student obviously have a different purview and the way they feel in the lab the postdocs the researchers at all the stages they have different connections within the lab also with the pi and this helps a student to decide that whether they should join a lab or not it is very important and i believe that this should be the first process for all the researchers who want to do a phd that first thing is do what makes you passionate there is always there has to be a question which you want to pursue for your you know phd program because there are people who join the lab just looking at the work or the status of the pi and this is one of the biggest problem which they face after you know spending number of years in there so if you can avoid it it is very good also as sydney said 
talking to all the PIs and the members in the lab will help you also see yourself that you can stay in that environment for four, five, six, seven years, depending on the program, how it goes. So Sid, now when you were interacting in multiple labs, I'm sure you have given interviews and then these interactions, what were the key points when you chose your present uh, institution? Yeah. Um, so when I interviewed at Florida, I felt very welcome. Everybody was super friendly and they seemed genuinely interested in talking to me. The PIs were enthusiastic about talking to me and actually interviewing me. And so that felt really good because it felt like a supporting environment where I could work. Whereas suppose some of the other places, it really felt like the grad students were overworked, which is a common thing for grad students, but it really showed in the conversations I had with them. They were too busy, didn't have time to talk to the um, interviewing potential grad students. So that made me feel a little uncomfortable applying to those schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the PIs and the students and the faculty um, at UF in this biomedical science department that I've applied to just seemed very welcoming and supportive and they wanted to provide an env environment where they wanted to see you succeed in your education. So that's kind of how I knew it was more like a gut feeling that I felt like the people here would support me in the four to five years I was here. Yes, nice. And the gut feeling is what people always say that gut feeling is something which takes you wherever you want to. So now uh, when you have chosen the university, uh, because in most of Indian universities, are the, we, do, we don't have plans of rotation system, but right. you have it here. So mm -hmm. when you are picking those labs, because now you are at the institute already in, in, in the university. Now, did you already figure out the labs you want to do your rotations? Yeah, so I actually got to the three or four labs that I was interested in interviewed me during the interview process and so that was really cool because I got to talk to those PIs like one-on-one -on -one. Um, and so I have three that I'm interested in rotating in already picked out and I've talked to them and I also got to talk to the grad students that work in their lab ask them about like their mentor style and the other people in the lab so I feel like I have a pretty good idea of the labs that want to rotate through and I'm excited that I already know and that I've met them because I think it could be pretty intimidating going in a rotation you only got three and i guess in india you don't get any which is can be a little yes. frightening mm -hmm. um but i'm glad that i've got to meet them ahead of time and i can be more confident that one of those three will be the one for me so what we know about research as we say this multiple times you know that it is fruitful when you get as what you want okay your projects working smoothly that is, I don't, I, I don't assume or I have never met even a single researcher celebrity till date where they can say that nothing failed in their life. How did you, uh, what we can say that, how do you actually prepare yourself for those bumps? Well, preparing myself, that's a hard question. I, so We've worked in Edelman's lab together, and I work closely with a lot of the grad students there, and I've talked to them, just had friendly conversations. I feel well prepared that they tell me a lot of the problems that they've had and how they've struggled through grad school. And so mentally, I know that it's going to happen. And I've done research um, previously with Dr. Edelman, so I know what it feels like to have experiments fail. And so through um, working with people in his lab and then conducting my own research, I think I know that it's inevitable that, you know, things are going to happen. You're going to be set back and you have to push through it. Um, and like I said, researchers are stubborn. I'm not really interested in quitting. So I think having all those, having the experience of failure happening with experiments and having people explain to me how it will happen and how they've handled it, I think I'm mostly well equipped to handle it when it happens. I think this is one thing which I always try to tell all the researchers here, that if you are doing PhD, doesn't matter if you are a faculty doesn't matter because these things as uh, Sydney said are inevitable so you have to prepare yourself with that and the best thing the best preparation you can do to this is the more research you do the more failures you get you overcome all of those and they prepare you for the next ones so as Sid said she has done a fair amount of research and interaction with the graduate student is what 
So sometimes you don't have to make all the mistakes by yourself. You can do learn from others' mistakes. And I think that is the way which you can save time for yourself, the resources for the institution and energy. We do talk about the burnouts graduate students get, and that is a real phenomenon. Sid, have you ever felt that? Yeah, I think I definitely have. Um, I think the time that I'm thinking about was when I was working with Dr. Edelman full time after getting my bachelor's. Uh, my job was like maintaining the lab. I was helping a lot of people, managing undergrads, taking care of um, maintenance mosquito lines. On top of that, I was having two research projects to take care of. And so obviously my responsibilities are to maintain the mosquito lines in the lab first before research. Research was sort of a second uh, because somebody has to maintain the lines. And it can be difficult because I would be staying in the lab later and later and spending more hours because I would finish maintenance and then I would need to continue research. And so I definitely, I started to get burnt out when I was doing that. I was like zooming through the lab, running back and forth, making sure everything was getting done, that everybody was happy and content so that I can do my research. And it got to be a little much. I was given like 110 and I realized that I couldn't keep doing that. So I had to draw back a little bit and it is unfortunate, um, but when you get burnt out, you make mistakes, you're not mentally thinking right. And so I had to slow down a bit to make sure that I was doing things correctly, that the lab was getting what they needed. Um, and I was able to balance my research and my maintenance a little bit better. So when we talk about my, uh, the burnouts, we always talk about the rejuvenation. What was your way of rejuvenating, getting back yourself into the men? Because mental health is something which in India now we are talking about for all the graduate students and in researchers in general. So what are, what are your experiences and what you can share with the audience here? Yeah, so but during my undergrad, you know, undergrads, it can be tough. It's your first time actually really applying yourself outside of high school. You really have to work to get your grades. If you're struggling, you have to go seek tutoring and all this other stuff. So for undergrad, I had a lot of ways to help maintain my mental health. I went on walks a lot. Once I was finished with everything, I need to take a break. I would go for a walk, just decompress, listen to music. Um, a lot of the times I would, um, you know, hanging out with friends helps a lot. It's important to have other people that you can talk to, talk to your feelings about, they can relate to you. That helped out a lot. I, I like writing and journaling. That helps my mental health. I think it's just good to have a bunch of little things to throughout the day, make sure you're taking care of yourself and you're not just 100% focused on research. You need to make sure you're you know, mentally well. So during undergrad, those are some little things that I used to do. Um, in terms of when I worked full time with the Edelman lab, um, I think, like I said, cutting back from going 110%, zooming through the lab, heart rate elevated, I, I took it back a notch and just tried to breathe a bit. And um, I used the time that I had to make sure I got some research done, but I was focusing on maintenance work. And I think dialing it back a bit allowed me to breathe a bit, to calm down a bit more, feel less anxious. And then mentally, I was feeling a lot better. Um, but the other thing, which I know was a little bit difficult for grad students, but being a full-time worker, I was able to take vacations periodically. And so I liked hiking and it really kind of reset everything to be able to go outdoors and spend some time in nature. And so that kind of would reset things so that I could continue doing research and maintenance and trying to pick up the speed. Absolutely. And, and I think this is one thing which is so individualistic that someone can just listen to a song and, you know, they're rejuvenated. Someone actually needs some more time, go to nature, spend time with, as you said, family and friends. They are the real power of any researcher. And in general, what we can say is any human being, because they are there for you forever either it is family or friends, and they do give you all that ear because when you are only talking to researchers, they have their suggestions, they have their criticism, they have their own, because one, the person is burned out, they don't want criticism. The only thing which they want is sympathy at that time. Mm -hmm. One who can sympathize with them and then family is number one and then friend are equivalent because some of your friends might not be from the same field. They might right. not even know what you are talking about, 
but they are just there listening to you and you feel so relaxed with that that okay now there is someone who's not judging me who's not telling me where i feel obviously you do need that criticism from your boss or you know what we always talk about the positive criticism where the things get done and boosting your confidence instead of you know giving up on you or you give up on the project because that is one thing which should not never happen but mm-hmm. the truth of researchers life is that that do happen and as you mentioned that researchers are stubborn yes absolutely but there are times when you have to draw the line that you really want to do this beyond or at the cost of mental health because when now we started talking about mental health i believe it is not only for researchers but it is more important for researchers because they are doing things repetitively and sometimes it is not only boring but you lose the zeal in there and then you don't want to do it that is the time when burnout happens and some people like in india and i believe uh, it is for the, the rest of the world also that phd students when they commit suicides it is the biggest thing anyone can do we always try to reduce it to zero but that is our aim towards this and why we are having these conversations with researchers around the world because at researcher celebrity what we believe is in celebrating the research one thing when anyone thinks about the word celebrity nobody thoughts about researchers sit let me hear your thoughts on this what are your thoughts on researcher celebrities yeah um i understand what you're saying that they don't, people don't often see researchers as celebrities I think a lot of people um, who aren't researchers, more the general public, it's hard for them to understand what we're doing. When we write papers, we use big, fancy words that they kind of contradict what we're trying to do. We're trying to communicate with people, but when we use this fancy language and all these science terms that nobody understands, I think they feel a bit disconnected with us. And so it's hard to sort of um, lift somebody to celebrity status when you don't know what exactly they did, why what they did is important. Um, so I, I don't know. I feel like there's sometimes a disconnect between the public and the researchers. They're not always great at communicating with each other. And so what we do is very important. We're always trying to help the world, but I don't think the world always understands what we're doing. I always say that researchers, obviously there are the best award, which people know is like the Nobel Awards in research and different fields. But what we believe at empowering sense foundation that even a single pcr done by any researcher they are they can be masters bachelors you know any researcher is that equivalently important and that's why we should start celebrating the research here and acknowledgement is one thing because nobel prize is nothing but an acknowledgement that someone has done something which not rest of the researchers were doing at that point of time because nobel prize also it's like annually they give it in to that and at research as celebrity what we do is we acknowledge the researcher the effort they have put or they are committed towards because emeritus has given their research experience their training they have trained different generations of researchers but now when we are talking to sit she is just starting her phd she has tasted the research in, in good and bad both way she picked to be more optimistic going to grad school we will say that this itself is a commitment which shows that how stubborn in uh, said's words how stubborn researchers are that nothing can stop them but said when we talk about accomplishments so nobel is the epitome of accomplishments in terms of giving a celebrity uh, status to any researchers but how you see accomplishment for a researcher which should be celebrated oof that's also a tough one um 
I don't know. I don't feel super qualified for this one. I haven't been here long enough, but um, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of ways to describe someone's like research accomplishments. I think if you've discovered something that's some important to you or even if it's like super small it's still an accomplishment it's still something we didn't know about a system before you completed that research so I don't know it feels wrong to say that anyone's research isn't an accomplishment Absolutely. because you know that just because I mean. it was small so yeah so that's what we always talk about so the best example is about the case man the system was discovered long back people don't even know the scientist's name Everyone knows Carpenter and uh, Jennifer Doudna. Doudna because they use the technology in a different way. That is not less than anything. The fundamental research, as you just mentioned, right? The basic research, the fundamental research was never negotiable, was not never that uh, fancy. But the people who utilize that, they always acknowledge it. Plus, they know the val value of it. This is when we are talking in terms of researchers together as a community. But when a person outside, I have seen people are very educated and very much interested in research. Okay, the mosquitoes are one thing which everyone can, you know, uh, feel that they know what mosquito is. They know mm -hmm. the spread. They know, some of them actually know that they are the deadliest animal on the world and they kill the most human beings annually when you work with something like this and now you have already planned to do with arboviruses so when you have this commitment that you want to make a change for human health that itself is what we say should be accomplished this is an accomplishment and we should celebrate it okay so now you work with mosquitoes, you are, are more interested in viruses. Where at the end of the goal, if you if I can ask this question, that at, where do you see yourself when you are finishing your PhD in terms of a researcher and the accomplishments? Yeah, so throughout my PhD uh, program, I'm hoping to do some internships to learn some bioinformatics techniques and just learn other ways outside of the lab. So those are some of the things I want to do up to the PhD or during my PhD. Um, it's hard to say what I want to do afterwards because I still, I haven't completed my PhD. Um, I'm thinking I'll probably, if I, as long as I enjoy it and I'm really passionate about it, I'll still continue working with um, viral genetics. And as far as like working, like what kind of position um, it's probably going to be either like academia or industry. I really enjoy teaching. So I'd love to have the opportunity to teach, whether it's working um, in industry with interns or in academia in like a lecture setting or working with other interns in the lab. Um, but I'm hoping to be able to teach and continue doing research. What exactly I'm going to be doing, it's hard to say right now. Oh, absolutely. No, this is the question was like this only that, as you mentioned, that you like teaching, you can do it in both the ways. And keeping these options open is also one thing which is very important because now in terms of uh, research globally, what we see that everyone says that industry is more luxurious, luxurious than academia. But some people, their dreams are only to be a professor. So they are very much clear from day one and they never even give a chance to industry or never look anywhere. But when you go with this close uh, attitude, it always have its own perks and demerits. It is the person who has to decide for themselves. And as you are already open for it, so this is a good thing in itself that you are open that, okay, you know what you want to do, it can be done either here or there. That is what is more important. Mm -hmm. So now we are uh, uh, walking towards the edge of the conversation here. So now let's talk about researchers as human beings okay you have done research you have been into lab for a longer duration what was the most funny thing you have uh you know came across or you like no one outside the research world can think that the researchers can be this funny also oh i felt like there's a lot of 
like researchers are fun people they some people think that we're like all boring scientists we're a bunch of like really unique eclectic people I think my favorite thing that happened in our lab I don't think you I can't remember if you were here for this yet but we had a, a like a shipment come in of reagents and it came with like a free inflatable t-rex it was a big green inflatable t-rex he was like maybe this big he wasn't that big but Bianca dressed him up in a lab coat and gave him some safety goggles and she did all she spent like 30 minutes doing a photo shoot with him her and Brian were positioning him around the lab and I think we named him Chester but he was like an honorary member of the lab and he would float around and you'd find him at your desk some days or sometimes he'd be pipetting I think I taught him how to do HRMR, HRMA one day. <laughs> she sat him at the desk and I was like pretending to point and teach him. So well, we're funny people. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and this is why we are having this conversation here is like most of the people think that researchers are very uh, like, especially when they say, like when we are saying researcher, they say scientists. Scientists are a bunch of crazy people who don't know, you know, anything about the outside world there always involved in their experiments and just uh, live crazy lives so here th th today i want to have this opportunity also to tell the rest of the public that researchers are very very humanly just like anyone outside the research lab we do enjoy we do do all the crazy stuff yes but crazy not only in science in lifetime also so Sid, uh, what was your thing, if you have to say for yourself, that apart from this, you have seen craziness of normal people talking about researchers? Oh, you mean what other people have said about researchers? Yeah. I don't know. Most of my friends are within research, so it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like a lot of people think we're mad scientists, though, like the stereotypical, we got fuzzy hair and we're always walking around with safety goggles and that we can't have conversations with other people because we're only able to speak in like science. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's like a common stereotype people have. And whenever you say you work in science or you, you know, you study genetics or whatnot, people tend to get very excited and they ask about all these crazy experiments. They're like, oh, have you done this? And I was like, no, why would I ever do that? That's crazy. Like, I don't think people know what we actually do. But I mean, most of my friends are in research, so I haven't, I don't think I've had an interaction with somebody where they said something crazy about what we do. Okay, so let's talk about your friends. When you tell them that you worked with mosquitoes, what were their first instinct? Okay, yeah, I see your point. That's good. <laughs> most people kind of give me a look like I'm crazy, and then they get really excited about it. And like, you work with mosquitoes? Like, tell me about that. Like, and they're, they're like, I think their first question is usually like, how often do you get bit? Because <laughs> most people think about working in a lab filled with mosquitoes. And they're like, that sounds terrible. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's not, it's not like that. We're not constantly getting bit. Um, but they're also like shocked. They're like, how did you end up there? Like, why do you raise mosquitoes? Like, what's the point of that? I, I like when people do it. I think it's, you know, I, we love talking about our research as scientists, but oh, yes. It's fun to talk to them about it because they have no idea like what we do or why we're studying mosquitoes. And there's so many like intricate things we do to rear mosquitoes. And when you explain it to people, they're very like shocked. And so it's fun to like show them our side of things. <laughs> so have you ever met anyone who does not know that the mosquito larvas are actually not? So in India, let me tell you this. When we used to go collections, then they're the public used to call them that they are the worms of water, the larvae, because they mm -hmm. obviously don't, for them, mosquito is a thing which flies, which bites them. They never even imagine the basic that they can be in the water for their aquatic life. So these are these small things where whenever, at least for myself, I was very proud to tell them so that we can train them so that they can save themselves from all this burden. And that's mm -hmm. why I always feel that doesn't matter at which stage of your career you are. If you are a researcher, you are working towards human health for making their lives better, even if they don't acknowledge it well. Okay. Right. And this is something which I always tell to all the researchers to keep this attitude with that acknowledgement. Yes. The, the least acknowledgement is the publications. When you publish it, everyone, there are like champagnes opening in labs that, okay, yeah, paper published in different journal. But I think in every day-to-day -day life, what 
most should be accomplished is like either your PCR worked or your experiment failed. One thing which you should be telling yourself that you went to the lab, you did something which you wanted to do, you accomplished it. Results might not come every day, but when they do come, it that is the last uh, nail in the coffin. But people don't like to call it, but that is the truth that for that last one, you have to be very perseverant and consistent in your efforts. Sydney, one last question. We talked about research. We talked about family and friends. We did talk about uh, burnout and rejuvenation. The only thing which we don't talk about is, do you believe in aliens? <laughs> uh, interesting question. Thank you, Rasha. <laughs> I guess... I didn't used to because I think most people think, ah, it's ridiculous. It's like Bigfoot. Why would you? Mm -hmm. But I don't remember who told me, but um, I remember being told that the universe is infinite and it's ridiculous to think we're, we're the only living things Sweet. in the universe. So I, I guess, yeah, I don't know what they look like. I kind of doubt they're big, like squishy green looking things. They're probably less, uh, <laughs> less of what you see on TV, but I don't study aliens. I don't know. Uh, absolutely no i think this is very good just keeping option open this so this shows that how strong a researcher you are because we as researchers never keep anything close we are always open that anything can happen so what we are doing we can say that okay i have done some experiment i can tell you if you'll do this you'll get this but there are different ways to do the same thing or there are different things which i might not be aware of sydney it was pleasure having you at the platform and now I would like to tell all the viewers that if they want to contact Sydney, her uh, email ID will be in the bio. And if you want Empowering Science Foundation to put you in touch with any of our researcher celebrity, you can write it to us also. Because we are here not only to put you in touch with our researcher celebrities, but we are here to ensure that you yourself become a researcher celebrity one day and we can't wait for that day that when a person contacts us and then we put them in touch with our researcher celebrity they get all the guidance what they want and then they appear on our platform with this small we'll say thank you very much sydney for taking time out and sharing the journey and no very problem. welcome for this and now the last thing good luck for grad school it will be a bumpy ride, but we are sure that you will excel it with flying colors. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.